Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation, the interview series about topics that affect the mind, the body, and all life around us. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to Dr. Jean Bauer, best selling author, director, and activist in the animal rights and food movement. Jean Bauer has been called the conscience of the food movement by Time magazine. He grew up in Hollywood, California, and worked in commercials for McDonald's and other fast food restaurants before adopting a vegan lifestyle. He has been campaigning to raise awareness about the negative consequences of industrialized factory farming in our cheap food system. Gene is the co-founder and president of Farm Sanctuary, America's leading farm animal protection organization. He played a significant role in passing the first U.S. laws to prohibit cruel farming systems, including the California ban on foie gras, and his efforts have been covered by leading news organizations and he's written two books. One, the first one called The Farm Sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Animals and Food, uh, and more recently, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, The Ultimate Guide to Eating Mindfully, Living Longer and Feeling Better Every Day. Uh, these books have become national bestsellers, and I'm just going to show one of them, the, the last, most recent one here. Highly recommend it. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to speak with you. Let me start with a, with the first sort of a personal question. What what happened in your life that made you change your trajectory from working at McDonald's and other fast food restaurants early in your life to becoming one of the most well-known and successful campaigners for animal welfare and a healthy diet? Well, I grew up like most people supporting a food system unwittingly that was causing so much harm to the earth, to animals, and to myself. And you know, as time went, I learned about the cruelty of factory farming. I learned about how calves raised for veal were chained by the neck and crazed their whole lives. And I didn't want to be part of it. I didn't want to be a cog in a wheel of a system that was causing so much harm. Uh, and it really was about other people telling me about the harms this system was causing. My, my grandmother first introduced me to it when she told me how veal calves are chained by the neck and crates their whole lives. Then I got involved with environmental groups and I learned from other activists about the inefficiency of animal agriculture, how we could feed more people with fewer resources by eating plants instead of animals. And then I learned it was possible to eat plants and to get all the nutrients we needed without eating animal products. And I thought, if I can live well without causing unnecessary harm, why wouldn't I? So I went vegan in 1985, co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986, and it was all based on this desire to live without causing unnecessary harm, to live in a way that I felt good about, that was aligned with my own values. So it's, it's really a, a fairly typical story that um, we, we grow up being totally unaware. We, we, we live the lifestyle that's sort of um, practiced by the majority of people. And then something happens and our, we, we become more mindful of the diet. And um, in some people, that mindfulness then translates into changing behaviors. So I think you really tell that same that story. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, human beings are very much social animals. We tend to do what those around us do. And we don't often think about the impacts or we don't think about them enough, I should say, and um, don't realize that we have other options and other choices we can make. And we also have a big infrastructure in place where you have fast food restaurants all over the place. It's very easy and, and convenient to make unhealthy harmful choices and everybody around us is doing it. So we start doing it without thinking. Uh, but when you step back and begin recognizing the impacts of our food choices and also recognize that we have an opportunity to make better choices, uh, that for me is how the change happened. There, there are many reasons to become a vegan from selfish reasons to live longer to altruistic reasons to reduce the suffering of animals to uh, environmental reasons to slow global warming. Um, 
what are the main reasons that led you to adopt the vegan lifestyle? Well, for me, it really started with ethics. I didn't want to cause animals to suffer unnecessarily. I also didn't want to harm the planet and the environment uh, the way animal agriculture does. So that's how it started. But I also realized that there were health benefits. And ultimately, I just wanted to live in a way that I felt good about that was aligned with my values and also aligned with my interests. And so for me, it's altruistic and it's also selfish. The, the vast majority of people living in the US are carnivores or omnivores simply because their food preferences have been shaped early in life because it is American to love steak and hamburgers. The, the majority of these people were never encouraged to be mindful of what they eat and where their food comes from. How successful have you been with your campaigns to change this situation? Now, as you say, uh, most people grow up eating a certain way. They're shaped by their social uh, and economic and uh, food ecosystem. And um, I think that most people, when they think about it, don't feel very good about factory farming. I think most people would rather support a system that doesn't cause such suffering to animals, would also rather eat food that is nourishing and makes them healthy instead of food that makes them sick. And in the US, it's been estimated that we could save 70% on healthcare costs by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. So eating animal products and processed foods the way we do is actually making us sick. And that, that's not in our interest. And I think most people would rather eat food that is healthy instead of food that makes us sick. I also think most people would rather support a food system that's not destroying the planet the way animal agriculture does. The United Nations put out a report a few years ago talking about how animal agriculture is one of the top contributors to the most significant environmental threats we face, including climate change, including the loss of biodiversity. And I think most people would rather not cause those harms. So to me, a large part of this has to do with just providing information and letting people know that they can actually be empowered to make choices that are better aligned with their own interests, that they can eat food that doesn't make them sick and that doesn't destroy the planet. And they can also uh, support a food system that is more aligned with their values. You know, today, oftentimes people will say, don't tell me, I don't wanna know when the issue of factory farming or animal slaughter comes up. And, you know, I think the good news is that we can know about that and we can choose not to support it and we can feel better about the way we're eating and not say, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Yeah, it's, it's been kind of interesting to me, um, having grown up in, in Munich, Germany, and um, in contrast to the US, there have been many TV documentaries and reports um, on primetime TV about the, you know, some of the horrific uh, things that are happening to, uh, to animals. Uh, so in Europe, a big thing is the, the, the whole long distance transport to the Middle East where 20% of the animals um, you know, die during this transport. And, and so this horrendous cruelty that happens just during the, during the transport, not even talk about the, you know, raising these animals. Um, but it's been interesting to me that that has not really changed the, the attitude. So f the next day people talk about it, how horrible it is, um, but nobody really has significantly changed their their, their eating habits. I mean, this is kind of a, an interesting human phenomenon that even if you, even if you see the, the cruelty and, and the reality of this, um, the majority of people are not willing to make a change. Yeah, no, I think one of the biggest obstacle is fear. People are afraid of change. And, you know, we are creatures of habit and we tend to do what is easy what we're used to doing. We create patterns of thought, patterns of behavior. And then we have a socioeconomic ecosystem that enables us to continue down those same patterns and paths, even if they're not healthy to us. And um, so change can be scary. And I think fear is often one of the biggest obstacles. And beliefs, you know, we believe, for example, or we're, we're raised to believe that you need to eat animal foods for health, which actually is not true. We're raised to believe that other animals are here for us to use and that somehow it's beneficial to us, but that's not true. I think actually exploiting and 
and killing other animals is not only bad for other animals, it's bad for us. Um, you know, can you imagine what it would be like to work in a slaughterhouse where your job eight hours a day is cutting the throats of animals? That's a very violent, bloody, stressful, unhealthy job. And so we grew up with these beliefs and, um, and then economic infrastructures where, you know, you have fast food restaurants and, and other places that sell meat routinely. Uh, and so change is scary, especially if everybody is doing things a certain way and a very few people are vegan and eating in a different way. Uh, it seems strange. It's a minority point of view. It's one that is oftentimes denigrated in public discussions, just like other minority points of view have been denigrated and criticized um, when they're different than the norm and when they challenge significant economic interests. So I think the vegan movement is challenging significant economic interests. It's also challenging uh, kind of a human identity, like what is our place on the planet? And, you know, we grow up believing that human beings have the right and, the in, and we're entitled to exploit other animals and the earth and that they are there for us to use. And the vegan movement is asking us to question that belief and to consider that human beings are part of the earth. We interact with other animals, but we don't need to act superior. And we are not superior, but we are part of a bigger uh, ecosystem uh, of life. And, and so that's a challenge for a lot of people who I think are used to this idea that human beings are, you know, the apex predator, we're at the top of the food chain, we're the most important, we're the smartest, we're the best, you know, superior creature on the planet. And as vegans, you know, we see ourselves as part of uh, a big ecosystem. It, it is true, I think that humans have a lot of power, we have technology. But I would also say that with that power comes responsibility and that we're not acting in a very respectful or compassionate way. And I, I don't think that that is, you know, good for us or others. Um, on, on the positive side, there, there seems to be a convergence of forces at the moment ranging from people fighting against climate change, environmentalists, proponents of a healthier diet, and groups fighting for animal wel welfare. And it, it, it almost, to me, seems like a, a, a paradigm shift um, that is happening now. To, um, and people join this movement coming from very different angles of, of, of life and from different motivations. Um, are, are you optimistic that these combined efforts will accelerate the transition to a largely plant-based diet? Yes, I am. And I completely agree that there is now a, a convergence of issues. We're recognizing the environmental and ecological harm of animal agriculture. Uh, we're recognizing the health problems. We're recognizing um, how our food choices have profound impacts on ourselves, on other animals, and on the earth. Um, there are also issues of justice and injustice that are, a, are part of this. Uh, oftentimes, for example, factory farms will be located in communities where people don't have resources. Uh, they're traditionally um, disenfranchised, uh, lower economic uh, uh, groups that uh, end up dealing with the pollution of factory farms. And in some cases, literally have animal waste that is sprayed into the air and gets onto and inside their houses. And this doesn't happen in wealthy communities. It happens in communities where people don't have the resources to fight these factory farms. And then you have labor issues. People who work in slaughterhouses and who work at factory farms tend not to have many choices. And they're often injured in these jobs and they don't have adequate uh, health care to address the problems they experience. So there are also issues of justice. There are spirituality issues. And um, and what is our place on the planet? Again, this gets into sort of profound questions about who human beings are and how we interact with others. So there are many things happening now from human health concerns, environmental concerns, ethical concerns about animals, and um, issues of what 
is appropriate human conduct on the planet. And, and I think most people would rather act in a humane way and in a compassionate and respectful way, as opposed to in a cruel and selfish way. So I think I'm very optimistic about the changes happening. Yeah, and it is remarkable when you see now demonstrations of young people, uh, this, um, this girl from, from Sweden who's, uh, who's now become a rock star in the uh, environmental movement. So that, there's many things. I, I think it seems to me almost that the climate change may become the main driver of all of this because the next generation of, of, of people realize uh, that this is going to be a potentially life-threatening issue for them. Um, and so my, uh, my feeling is, you know, people are kind of selfish. I mean, they, so eating a healthier diet that's healthy for them, they don't really think about the environment that much, or now uh, worrying about climate change and how it affects them, in somewhat seems to me bigger motivators than the altruistic uh, attitude that, or, or the, the altruistic rationale that people think, well, let's, let's just go beyond my own benefit. Let's think about the benefit of other life forms uh, around us. I, I think you're right. And I think climate change is an existential crisis. And many young people are concerned about the, their ability to live on this planet and to enjoy life. And, and I agree that most people are motivated by their self-interest. Uh, but even that motivation means that they will act in ways that cause less harm to others, because ultimately, I think we are, are all connected. And climate change, as you say, I believe, is one of the top motivators right now. And the United Nations has talked about how climate change um, is affected more by animal agriculture than by the entire transportation industry. And I think more and more people are seeing that and are addressing that issue through their food choices. Yeah, staying with some of the positive um, developments. So there's, um, there's a movement of major corporations started in Europe and has now been, become very successful in the US to obtain this so-called B Corp certification. Um, and this is basically <clears throat> a list of criteria where corporations pledge to, to certain requirements and pledges um, they, don't, they go beyond uh, shareholder value and beyond uh, CEO um, uh, incomes. And one of these criteria is support of humane treatment of animals. Uh, as you may know, <clears throat> Patagonia and Danone, North America, have become the most well-known companies in the U.S. that have been certified as uh, B corporations. So this is just another example um, that I see that I think these, these companies... I mean, they may do it for different motivations. Uh, they may do it for responding to changing consumer demands, particularly if their customers are younger people. Um, they, they may do it out of real um, environmental concerns, like uh, the, the owner of uh, Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard. Um, do you think, I mean, have you run into this and have, have, have you... Um, Talk to people that are part of this uh, this movement. How uh, successful that um, that that particular uh, element, this humane treatment of animals, uh, how how successful that has been in their in their overall business um, uh, practices. Yes, I have, and as you say, I think these companies recognize that consumers do not want to support businesses that they feel are acting irresponsibly and causing enormous cruelty and destroying the planet. And I think that, you know, corporate responsibility is becoming an increasingly important part of the corporate calculus and the economic perspective and recognizing that they need to stand for something because consumers, you know, want to feel good about the businesses that they're supporting. Um, and, you know, in addition to addressing animal welfare issues and, you know, pledging not to support certain types of factory farms, which I think is very positive, you know, you have companies that are also not wanting to support the destruction of rainforests, for instance, uh, and most rainforests are being cut down to grow soybeans or to, to feed farm animals or to graze and raise farm animals. So um, as companies act in more responsible ways, and they act with more of a desire to align their behaviors with society's values and interests, 
I think we're going to continue to see a shift away from factory farming cruelty and towards a more sustainable plant-based agriculture system. And you even have huge companies now that are starting to invest in vegan companies. Um, you know, Danone, for example, who you mentioned, recently purchased White Wave, which produces the silk soy milk, and other, which is plant soy milk or other plant-based milk. So Danone, in addition to having some animal welfare policies, is investing more in plant-based businesses. So I think that's a very positive sign. Another um, interesting thing that has happened, sort of a, I think an offshoot of the Paris Climate um, um, Summit uh, last year, is this Eat Lancet report uh, that urges people to adopt a largely plant-based diet to save planetary health and slow climate yeah. change. Do you want to say yes. what's about that? No, I think that that's one of many reports that has come out and is all driving in the same direction. You know, whenever scientists look at empirical reality, look at the earth, look at human impacts on the earth, um, they're finding that our agriculture system is causing enormous harm. And that primary to that is our animal-based food system. And that by shifting to eating more plants and away from animal agriculture, we can have significant beneficial impacts. So yeah, that was, it was very good to see that report. Um, and it is one of many. And, and another statistic that is to me shocking is when you look at life on earth, and this was a study that came out a few months ago, uh, and you, compare domestic animals to wild animals, you know, animals that are domesticated versus those that still live wild in uh, open wild ecosystems. 96% of the mammals are either human beings or domesticated. And the vast majority of those are farm animals. 96%. Um, when it comes to birds, 70% are domesticated, mostly chickens that are raised for slaughter and only 30% are wild. So we need to preserve wild habitats. And a key way to do that is to not cut down rainforests in order to grow feed for farm animals. We could feed like 10 times more people by growing plants instead of animals. So these reports I think are very important. They're shining a light on the empirical reality. And I really love that this most recent report explicitly says that we can make a significant difference by shifting away from eating animal foods towards eating more plant foods. Now, one interesting aspect that, that I personally, um, was really my um, um, channel that I have come to this, to this topic is really um, the, the consequences of um, plant-based versus you know, meat predominant diet on, on, on human health, um, on the um, on the gut microbiome and with all the consequences for um, for the host metabolism and um, pretty much every function that that, that our human body um, has and um, so one one consequence and this is still unfortunately hotly debated almost like uh, culture wars uh, in the in the in the um, food area it's hotly challenged by people that you know, adhere to the paleo, to the keto diet, uh, because um, even when this report came out, the, the, the EAT report, uh, there were, you know, fierce criticisms that this was uh, supported by companies like Monsanto that basically wants to increase the sales of plant-based foods. This is something remarkable that if, even if you ignored all the other aspects that we have been talking about, the, the benefit of a largely plant-based diet for human health um, and for the diversity and abundance of our microbiome system in our gut is, is indisputable. There's absolutely no, uh, no, no question about that. And um, so that, that's kind of another um, uh, avenue that, that will lead to the, exactly the same conclusion that moving to a uh, largely plant-based diet is, is the only way to go for the future. Yes, I completely agree. And, you know, too often we become used to certain bad realities like heart disease. 
And even doctors are not as well versed in nutrition as they should be. And they have historically been far too close to the pharmaceutical industries and towards prescribing and recommending medication that's not necessary. Now I'm getting to be in my late 50s now and I had not been to a doctor in decades. And about 10 years ago, I went to a doctor uh, just to get a checkup to make sure everything was fine. And the doctor started asking me about my family history. And when I told him that my grandfather died of a heart attack and that my father had a heart attack, this doctor, without taking any blood or you know, doing any tests, said he might wanna recommend I go on heart medication. And I was stunned, um, but that's just an example of how there are certain patterns and how our country is too often very quick to go on certain medications that could be prevented and, and health problems could be prevented by choosing a healthier plant-based diet. You know, Hippocrates, the founder of Western medicine said, let food be thy medicine. And I think one of the primary motivators for many people today who are going vegan or vegetarian or reducing their meat consumption is to improve their own health. And there are great documentaries out now. You can see them on Netflix and through other uh, online channels or even on TV sometimes that are talking about and, and showing examples of people who have gotten off of diabetes medication or heart medication or various other medical um, inputs by eating plants instead. So. Uh, I think that's a very strong motivation. And, uh, you know, most people would rather feel good and feel healthy instead of feeling sick and taking pills and other medications to relieve their ailments. Yeah, just uh, giving a, you know, a, 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 a brief story about the area that I'm working as a gastroenterologist. Um, you know, colon cancer screening at age 50 has sort of become a, a, a generally accepted standard. Now, um, studies have, are indicating that the, the age group where colon cancer is rising the fastest is actually in people under 50. And so the way the medical system has responded to that challenge is not questioning, could this have anything to do with our diet and the um, you know, resulting obesity epidemic? Or, um, uh, I mean, instead, they, they responded to this challenge that we lower now the threshold or the age limit for colon cancer screening to 45. So if this trend continues, you know, we'll, we're gonna be uh, recommending to do colon cancer screening um, at an earlier and earlier age. And when I ask people about, have any of these studies taken into account the dietary habits of people? Um, mm -hmm. and, and the answer was no. Um, people that undergo colon cancer screening will not get a counseling in nutrition um, even though we know, uh, you know that uh, consumption, high consumption of red meat um, is a definite uh, risk factor and uh, also cured meats is a definite risk factor for, for, for colon cancer. So this is amazing. another, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing example. Yeah, yeah you know, it's a great example and, it, and, and it's so unfortunate because people are suffering and people are dying at a young age, uh, but uh, there's just sort of this myopic view and this failure to recognize that by being more mindful and making smarter choices about our food, we can get off of medication and improve our health. You know, the, the sad reality is that, you know, there are industries now that are built around illness and um, it's sort of not in their interest to look very hard. Um, and I'm not saying that these are bad people or there's a conspiracy or anything, but um, you know, when, when the norm, uh, you know, when everybody's doing things a certain way and when people are making a living doing things a certain way, there's oftentimes a desire not to think about other ways. And, uh, and that's the same in the food industry too. You have huge grain companies that are, are making lots and lots of money growing soy and corn to feed animals. And when, you know, the, the um, domestic consumption doesn't keep up, then they push it externally to export markets. Uh, same thing with the dairy industry, we overproduce. And so people are making money on that, oftentimes with government subsidies, uh, financial support, and, um, and it's a whole system that needs to change ultimately. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, let me change um, the, the topic a little bit. Um, 
Uh, one, one of the biggest environmental impacts of the colonization of North America by the Europeans has been the near or uh, almost complete extermination of millions of bisons and as a consequence, the destruction of an entire ecosystem, the prairie tall grass uh, ecosystem, which was dependent on the buffalo as a keystone, so-called keystone uh, species. And there are efforts to bring back the buffalo in parts of the US. And um, it seems that these efforts are crucially dependent on a commercialization aspect um, of buffalo meat, um, meaning selling uh, buffalo meat in, in, in limited amounts. So I've seen this myself. Um, I, my attention was first drawn to this in a conversation with uh, Yvonne Chouinard from Patagonia. Um, so these animals in some of these ranches are humanely killed and packaged in their own environment without the horrors of industrial meat production. As a vegan, <coughs> what, what is your view of these efforts that would be impossible without the consumption and sale of, of buffalo meat? Yeah, no, it's a, uh interesting and an evolving issue and um, I think for buffalo to be on the range and have open spaces and to be repatriated in a sense to their native lands is a positive step. It's um, better than European cattle on the range and in fact you know when the Europeans came uh, and uh, colonized the area and pushed away Native Americans, part of it had to do with the cattle replacing the buffalo, so, or the bison. So I think that, you know, repatriating bison to native lands is a positive thing. Of course, as a vegan, I don't like the idea of them being killed. Um, and I think hopefully what can start happening is that as more bison are on the range and fewer domesticated livestock, uh, cattle, for example, and as more of the land that's now being used to grow corn and soy to feed farm animals can be turned back over to native prairies uh, with more habitat for bison, uh, you'll have more nat natural spaces. And by shifting to a plant-based agriculture system, we can actually allow the bison to have a lot of space and just allow habitats to evolve and, um, and be and grow food in much smaller areas. We could also do a lot in urban agriculture with vertical farming, um, rooftop gardens. Um, and by growing plants instead of animals, we could feed far more people with far less land. So I like the idea of bison uh, on the prairies and um, I would love to see them free and able to live out their lives without being killed. And, you know, to me, being a vegan ultimately is about creating mutually beneficial relationships with other animals where they're allowed to live, we're allowed to live, and that we each kind of enrich our own lives by the interaction. And seeing buffalo on the range running free, I think, does something good to our spirit. And to me, that's a very positive thing. Uh, and the idea of humane slaughter is one that I'll also just bring up. And, you know, when you think about it, the word humane and the word slaughter don't really fit very well together. So um, it's better that bison are outdoors and have a good life as opposed to cattle who are raised in feedlots. But killing is still killing. And if it's unnecessary, and, and I believe it is unnecessary, um, you know, that would be the direction I hope we can go in. Um, I do understand, you know, there are financial issues right now and perhaps financial incentives to kill animals, um, but I don't like that. And I would love us to get to a place where um, just enjoying the company of other animals and the presence of other animals um, would generate some economic benefits. And, and you're seeing this now with, with whale watching, for example. You know, for centuries, human beings would kill whales and use them for their fat, and it was an extractive relationship. Now, um, there are boats that go out with people that pay money to watch the whales. And, you know, in some cases, those might be invasive and not necessarily very healthy, but it's 
a more of a mutually beneficial kind of relationship, you know, as opposed to one that's extractive. So I would love us to get to a similar place with bison. Yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, people pay, similar to the whale watch, I mean, people pay a lot of money to go on, on African safaris to see yes. wildlife. Um, you would imagine it would be equally fascinating, uh, at least as fascinating, um, to, you know, take tours and watch tens of thousands of buffaloes roaming around in, you know, the way they used to. So, um, Absolutely. It's an appreciation economy instead of an exploitation economy. And, and, you know, again, seeking to create mutually beneficial relationships, to me, is a big part of what it is to be vegan. And that includes mutually beneficial relationships with other animals, uh, but also with the earth and with ourselves and with other people. And another part of being vegan to me is addressing abuses of power. And this goes back a little bit to what I said earlier about human beings having a lot of power. And too often we take that to mean that we are entitled to our, you know, to kill others and use them however we want. But, but I think that with power comes responsibility. And uh, unfortunately power does tend to corrupt and it actually tends to undermine our empathy. And I think empathy is a really important part of our humanity that I think, you know, vegans are trying to reclaim and encourage others to reclaim. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me come back to another paradox that uh, it's always been difficult to, uh, for me to understand. It's, it's the obsession of many people in Western societies, actually increasingly, with the well-being of their pets um, while the same people are completely oblivious to the treatment of uh, farm animals. Um, so, you know, people are willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars in this country for, um, you know, uh, for medicine and treatments for their animals when they get sick, but they have absolutely no concern whatsoever for animals that they don't consider pets. How, you, I mean, you must run into this a lot in your, in your campaigns. How do you explain that? Yeah, that inconsistency is something that has bothered me for a long time. In fact, Farm Sanctuary's first bumper sticker said, if you love animals called pets, why do you eat animals called dinner? And, you know, I think it really boils down to prejudice and discrimination. There are certain animals who we get to know, who we bond with, who become part of our family, and who we love. And there are others who we see as exploitable commodities. And the same thing could be said over the course of human history, where there have been certain groups who are considered to be valued and other groups who are considered to be less valued. And when it comes to companion animals versus farm animals, that's the case. You have companion animals who live with us, who live in our houses, who are part of our families, who we love, who will do what everything we can to help, uh, but then there are animals who we eat, who we actually have, I think, an emotional interest in not getting to know, because if we get to know them, we may not feel good about what we're doing. So there is, I think, this disconnect and this dissonance between empathy and connection and compassion in our behavior. And so when it comes to farm animals, uh, we exploit and abuse them, so we don't want to see them a certain way. And what this also does, I believe, is it, it actually leads to attitudes of abuse. Uh, when there is a perpetrator of abuse who has power over a victim, um, oftentimes the perpetrator will denigrate the victim, perhaps to make themselves feel better about how they're mistreating this other individual. And in the US, you know, some concrete examples of this sort of subtle discrimination, prejudice denigration is how we refer to farm animals. Uh, and, you know, we'll insult people, for example, by calling them a turkey. You know, that's denigrating the person, but it's also implicitly denigrating the turkey. Um, or being called a pig is also not a compliment. So those are examples of how certain animals are subtly and routinely and kind of mindlessly denigrated. And, and then we create narratives as well to further these beliefs, you know? And one thing I remember hearing many, many times over the years is that 
turkeys are really dumb. They're so dumb, they'll go outside and drown in the rain, for example. It's, it's a story I've heard. But at Farm Sanctuary, we've taken care of turkeys and chickens and other farm animals. And we let them go inside and outside as they, as they wish. And we have never had a turkey go outside and drown in the rain. And we've been caring for them for over 30 years. And so there are these stories that then are created to justify and uh, validate certain beliefs. And, and sometimes those beliefs are completely off track. And I think that's the case with how we treat other animals. And, and I'll just also say that which animals are considered to be companions and which are considered to be sacred or part of our family varies from place to place and culture to culture. In some parts of the world, people eat cats and dogs. And in the United States and other Western countries, uh, we're oftentimes appalled by that, thinking, how can you eat a cat or a dog? Because, you know, they're our friends. Uh, but in other countries, they don't eat cows, for example. But in the US, we eat cows routinely. In some places, they eat horses. In other places, they don't. So which animals we eat and which ones we see as our companions is really quite arbitrary and it varies from place to place. And, and as a vegan, for me, at the end of the day, uh, all of these animals are living creatures. And if we can live well without harming any of them, you know, to me, that's the best course. Yeah, let me uh, ask you something. Um, we're coming towards the end of the interview. Let me ask you something. Um, so you've been very successful in your efforts to raise awareness around the connection between your, our own health, planetary health, and the welfare of animals, making these links almost, um, you know, there's no question that these links exist, and you have been pushing this kind of insight uh, quite successfully. What, what do you see as the most important steps towards the realization of these goals beyond what you have accomplished in the farm uh, sanctuary and, and, and your other campaigns? Well, I think one of the most important ways that we're going to be able to achieve the changes we need are to change structures and systems. And that includes uh, institutions like the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and uh, which right now is giving billions of dollars every year to animal agriculture and supporting a system that is inefficient, inhumane, and destructive. And so I think shifting systems, and part of that has to do with economic infrastructures, you know, like government subsidies. But another part has to do with um, business structures and incentivizing more plant-based agriculture. Um, there are farmers markets now that have been spreading across the US. That is a very positive thing. There are community supported agriculture programs also spreading across the US. And both of these connect consumers more closely to the source of their food. There are community gardens. There's a food not lawns movement where people who have a lawn are now tearing up the lawn and turning it into a vegetable garden. And instead of having gardeners come in and just mow the lawn, which you know people in suburbs often do, um, they can hire people to grow vegetables. And, then in, and so every week they get a box of vegetables. So these I think are very positive steps in a good direction, but they need to be supported more through infrastructures. And that includes government policy. It includes big businesses investing. And we're seeing some of that, but it also involves community orientation, uh, medical profession, recognizing the benefits of plant-based eating, which is gonna you know, create a shift in our pharmaceutical industry. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure stuff that I think needs to change. Uh, access to land, making land available in urban areas to grow food, making land available to new farmers who wanna grow plant foods that are healthier for people and incentivizing that instead of the financial system now where you have uh, smaller farms being bought up by these bigger factory farms. And so creating tax laws that incentivize small farms to stay in business and discourage industrial agriculture and factory farming from taking over small farms. So those are some examples, but to me, it's really about infrastructure and systems that, that need to change. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Gene. This was a fascinating conversation. Um, I, I find it particularly fascinating that, that the two of us have come to, this, to the same conclusions coming from very different angles. 
uh, and, and professions. Um, and I hope many other people will come from whatever place they're in currently uh, with these same realizations. So it's really short in the beginning. Here is a, a great book if people want to read more about this topic and with a lot of practical advice of how to accomplish this transition from whatever dietary habits they have at the moment to a, a much more mindful um, and compassionate attitude towards, towards the planet and uh, other uh, living creatures. So thank you very much for the time you took for this conversation and uh, look forward to interacting with you in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's great to talk with you and, and thank you for your work and for everything you do also to raise awareness and to promote health and well-being. I think we're, we're, <laughs> we're all trying to create more of that in the world. Thank you.